and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple. The double-headed monster that is Homie and the Dude, and, cur <laughs> and currently spearheading the Sky Zephyr's expansion to D&D 5th Edition. The, oh, yeah. one, the one and only in the red corner, um, Bo Bodhi Camboris, and in the blue corner, Tom Camboris. There we go. <laughs> we're still, we're still Wait, trying to figure out... Weighing in at a small 155 pounds. <laughs> Look, I'm not trying to get my su get myself sued by the Buffer family, all right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a safe play, dude. That's a safe play mm. for sure. Thanks for having us. Thank yeah, you. thank you for thank you for having us. It's it's a pleasure to be in your temple and yeah. to, to to be bestowed by such a gracious monk of of <laughs> of, of your, your your caliber. Quite an intro. Quite an intro. Yeah, I get I get that quite a bit. Um, yeah. That and people people being surprised that monks drink. Yes. I oh, still, yeah. yeah. I still don't know why that's a shock. I mean, there's whole monasteries that brew their own beer. I mean, yeah. the drunken master is, you know, that, that came from monks. It's true. Drunk ass monks. But don't they drink mead as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, dude, I'm, dude, I'm sure they're drinking Whiskey. something. You can, you can't be up in the mountains all day and and not be drinking something. <laughs> surely, it's cold as hell up there. <laughs> yeah, and. Well, in some, in some cases, it's in some cases you're up you're up in the mountains. You got you got fuck all to do. So so exactly may, may, as, well, may exactly. as well make some may as well make something. But yep. so it's one of the traditions around here is the humble beginnings. So mm -hmm. I'd like you two to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. That's a that's a that's a that's a great one. That's a great question. Do you want me to do mine or do you want to do yours? Uh, do you want to do it go together? for it. No, let's, yeah, let's go back and forth. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, for me, I was first introduced to Dungeons & Dragons at 3rd edition, 3.5, when I was 13 years old, 13, 14 years old. My drama teacher, who was a massive inspiration in my life, ended up you know, pushing me to take acting and, and, and study performing arts later in my life. Um, he held on Saturdays a um, a Dungeons and Dragons group, basically, for for the the students of the school, and um, and I started attending that. I, I loved the role playing. I loved the like getting into character, and I loved all that. However, at the time, um, I was battling like my dyslexia at the time, and though I still am, it was far worse back then. I hadn't learned as many tools to handle um, dyslexia as, as I have now and so I just didn't agree with all the numbers and all, all like the, the mechanics and the remembering everything for for 3.5 it was just a lot to kind of take in and to, to handle um, however then grew up um, and when the pandemic started um, I found a YouTube group called Corridor Di well, I didn't I've been following Corridor Digital for many many years and they have a side channel called Node, where they run them playing many games and things like that. And one of the series that they did on there was an actual play series where they played D and D. And this is the first time I'd seen people play D and D on the internet um, myself, and I was just kind of blown away. I was like, "This is really freaking cool that they're out here telling a story on the internet and playing D and D, and that's really sick." And uh, I showed Tom, and then from there, you went and did research. Yeah. I'll pass over to you. Yeah, we were. I don't know what what uh, precipitated me searching on the internet. I guess it was just Bodhi saying, "Yeah, the people play D and D on the internet." So went to YouTube, just searched. I I, I don't even remember what the search was, but um, Acquisitions Incorporated came up, and uh, it was the old live shows that they would do at PAX. And mm -hmm. so you have Chris Perkins at the helm, and there's just this magnificent set cast. and cast. Patrick oh. Rothfuss and was it Mike Mike, Mike Rahulik yeah. and. Uh, I can't remember the, the bold guy. But it just... Um, uh, incredible. It was a moment... It was like one of those, you know, pretty transformative moments where mm -hmm. everything changed after that. And we... You know, I immediately shared it with Bodhi and said, look, this is... This is 
not only like interesting to watch as a D&D game, but it's fucking entertaining, funny, you know, all the things. And uh, and then from there, we kind of went to Fantasy High, um, you know, got introduced into into Critical Role, and uh, we were off and running. And that was probably about three years ago. And, you know, since then, we've been doing, you know, several different renditions of, of uh, kind of investing in the D&D community and the D&D world. Yeah. And uh, we started there with the starter pack. When when it all came through and through, we we, we bought the the Lost Mines of Fandelver, as it was back then, mm-hmm. uh, starter pack, and uh, and we we dove in with that. And then from there, I realized that again that damn dyslexia rearing its head, and I just couldn't run modules. I, I for some reason I just my my brain just wouldn't let me act and do all the things I wanted to do while having to consider what the book wanted me to do or was guiding me to do. So um, from that moment on, we went homebrew, um, and I started homebrewing my own world and homebrewing everything, and uh, and that's how we ended up where we are today with, you know, a whole, whole homebrew world, um, you know, a Kickstarter that centers around vehicle combat and, and you know, uh, specifically sky-based travel and all that kind of stuff, and it uh, it became it became a whole thing, you know, and and it, it's been now. You know, two and a half years of my life, I've I've invested in in this whole thing, and that's it's kind of where we started. Though it all it all started with an original love from me, following then essentially discovering Acquisitions Incorporated and falling in love with you know Chris Perkins, the cast, the way he tells stories, the the freedom, the creativity, the crowd interaction, the comedy, and then from there for you it was Patrick Rothfuss and finding his books and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff, and we just we just. Once the snowball started rolling, we we couldn't stop it. No one could really. At this point, you know, we're deep in with D and D as well as many other you know systems. We played other systems at this point, and uh, yeah, we just we just love tabletop role playing games. It's yeah. a it's a beautiful storytelling space that I don't think we ever imagined we could step into. We we always you know we loved cinema, we loved television, we loved you know. Um, Movies and amazing and anime and, and books and all this, you know, different, you know, forms of media, and we just never imagined that we could be part of it and create some of our own without having to, you know, fire away into like a Hollywood or write our own book or you know mm. do this kind of stuff. So it was just really great, man. We're we're, we're stoked to be finally here mm. with a lot of people who knew about it for a lot longer than we did. Yeah. Yeah. Now, even though Sky Zephyrs is is built around adding airship combat. Um, mm-hmm. I do, I do want to ask, what to you guys is the appeal of the of these sorts of these sorts of Zeppelin esque um, airships that you want that Great. you wanted to have that as the focus? Great question. So um, the reason we made uh, it so Sky Zephyrs as a whole is a you know vehicle. Uh, overlay for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. It's a rule set that can be put over any setting basically and allow you to include um, flight based vehicles in your game. Now this could also, we have a conversion chapter at the end of the book that allows you to you know, use the same rules for space, for um, underwater, for on water and for on land uh, mm-hmm. rule sets as well. Um, the, 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 the reason we chose the Zephyrs, as we call them, um, these like Zeppelin-style naval ships that fly through the skies with fans, sails, balloons, propellers, all that kind of stuff, was because my homebrew world, uh, at what, what we call the Sky Realm, is a, um, is a world of floating islands, and I needed a way to get from one island to another. Now, I'm a huge fan of animated movies like, uh, you know, Howl's Moving Castle, uh, Treasure, Pla- uh, Treasure Planet or Treasure Island, I think it's Treasure Planet, um, and uh, and like Atlantis, the Lost City, and like all of these movies have like a strong steampunk kind of vibe to them, and like hard steampunk feel about everything that's kind of there and, and, and involved. And so for me, that that steampunkness kind of has always been a thing that I've loved. And so I wanted to create something that was both modern and also old at the same time to encapsulate that steampunk feel of high technology with low, gr- like low feeling grit, like just it, it still looking like it's you know it's it's old timey. So we came up with this style of you know balloons, you com- you know lift and control components of the ships, you know allowing it to look a certain way, and then the bodies of them, at least the ones we've designed, to to, to look a certain way. Now. 
we've specifically not included art for every every ship. We have 25 plug and play ships um, in the book, uh, as well as also five ships with fully laid out battle maps and things like that that you can get through the extras tier. Um, but we've left it open because this is meant to be a plug and play system. We want it to suit whatever your world looks like. So if you want, you know, the flight based systems to look more like planes, then you can make the, the ships look however you want using the same parts and mechanics and feel that we've created. But we wanted to leave it open to everyone though, mm -hmm. you know, for us, we needed something to represent what we were talking about. So we chose what we already know, which comes from my world. And, uh, and that's the route we went down. Now, given given that you're going for variety for a variety of ships, mm. um, I do want to I do want to ask a question regarding scale. Mm -hmm. So yes, because a lot of t a lot of times when pe when people talk about adding ships, um, there's always the issue of okay, how big or small are we are we talking with when it comes to what we're adding? Because mm -hmm. You look, you look at naval fleets, or or just a get, or just a game of ba just a game of battleship, <laughs> and it's not all it's not a one size fits all affair. You have the big fuck off ba battleships, of course. You have your ships mm -hmm. of the line. You you have your escort ships and the like. And once once some um, once other technologies are introduced, you have just sink just single um just single mm -hmm. use fighters, mm -hmm. and. What sort? What sort? The question that I have is: What sort of scaling are you planning to su to support in that r in that range? Is it going to be as wide as you can make it? Do, are you going to be having fighters? That sort of thing is, it's, dude, uh, a phenomenal question. One that you know, actually, um, we from early on we wanted to make sure that there was a, a massive range of customize customizability and options for players and GMs alike. So, first of all, I'll say the, the 25 plug-and-play Zephyrs, as we call them, or, or example, you know, airships, or whatever you want to kind of label them as, those range from tiny all the way through to huge. Now, a tiny um, Zephyr can carry one or two people, basically, depending on how you want to design it. And it's about, what, 10? It's two, but two blocks on the map two to three blocks it, on yeah the map. it's it's about 10 to 15 feet yeah, yeah 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 it's it you know and they can range you know from from th there's an average square footage to kind of give you an idea of how much space this this thing kind of takes up and that ranges all the way to huge now huge can have a crew of uh upwards of like 80 basically 80 to 100 people basically on the ship um operating at once and you know these are gargantuan these are massive freaking ships that take up lots of space and are, are, are very very big so yes you can have everything from a one person fighter all the way through to you know like i said a hundred person dreadnought um you know a, a thing of pure destruction you know aircraft carriers type chip um as well as that we've created something that we're super super proud of which is our uh hat deep builder website application which will allow people to choose from over currently we have, we plan to expand to not only different types of vehicles but expand this list as well but you can choose from over 200 parts and stations to build your dream uh, airship now again that could be in any size from tiny to huge so that includes small medium large and huge you know and you can choose whatever size you want for for your ship that you build in the builder basically so Again, the range is massive. The options that we have created here are colossal. There, there's, there's an endless stream of options mm. for you to combine, to mish and mash together, to, to choose and select, to upgrade and downgrade, to you know, all this kind of uh, stuff for your, for your Zephyrs uh, as you go through and your vehicles as you go through. Yeah, and, and within the builder, the other cool thing is that once you've selected all your parts, you know, you've you've thought about what it can and can't do, and like in real time, it's assembling a stat block for the ship. So, mm -hmm. once you've you've made your final decisions, you just really hit the button, and there you go. There's your immediately created ship stat block and your in-world build cost for the ship. So it's it's pretty um, satisfying to be able to like you know, and you you can then go back, you know, hit the back button, change some things around. Export it again, and this can be, you know, a digital export, or it could be a PDF that you take to your, 
you know, to your table in real life. So we really like it. It's super, super exciting. Um, mm -hmm. It's also great for then printing out as well. You can take the stat blocks. They're, they're usually about one or two pages, dependent on the size of the ship. And it's a great thing to then print out and like hand out to the the party, you know, when they're when they're at the table, as well as also using the cheat sheets as we call them, or or combat trackers that we're going to be including in the Kickstarter as part of the extras tier. Mm. Um, you can get uh, essentially ways to track all of this and do it a lot easier through printable. Um, documents basically that you could then like laminate or if you want to use a pencil on or whatever mm -hmm. um and track all, all, all your ship stuff uh manually as well yeah now some games will will take will take multiple approaches when it comes to the relationship with mm -hmm. ship and character um in some mm -hmm. cases they the approach is each ship each ship is its own character in some cases the player characters occupy different roles on the ship. That a mm -hmm. a good example of that that I recently ran would be um, Coriolis, mm -hmm. you know, which is basically Lawrence of Arabia in space. Okay, yeah. not exactly, but that's the but that's the, that's yeah. that's the best um, skinny of of it. But in mm -hmm. that one, each you have one person playing the captain, one person playing engineering, one person playing the gunner, etc. Um. Where does Sky Zephyrs fall within that spectrum, or can it handle each, depending on what parts of the book people want to use? That is a freaking awesome question, dude. Some great questions here. Um, so, to answer your question simply, um, we the, the Zephyrs and vehicles that we're creating are simply to add extra options for players during combat. You know, we remembered, and we tried to really lead with the fact that the end of the day, this is about the players, not about the airship. Now, having a kick-ass airship is great, but it's just as good as having a kick-ass rapier on your hip. You know, it's more about how you use it and the abilities that it has, um, you know, that then allow you more options within combat and within travel and with general usage and things like that. So the answer to your question is anybody can take any role on the ship they want. That is completely up to the players. Now... We do have a list of, I believe, 13 player feats, brand new style player feats, that do kind of give each person a more specific role on a ship. So, for example, we've got the Sky Medic, we've got the Mechanic, we've got the Arcane Fuelman, we've got the Necromantic Ward, you know, we've got the Cuisiner, we've got the Entertainer. You know, each of these feats comes with special abilities that allow you to do different and special things upon an airship that other people in the group wouldn't be able to do. So if your party wish to take roles or have more concrete roles, then we suggest just taking one of the feats from the list or creating your own feat to suit a role that you want uh, at your table, basically. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, in terms of whether the ship is, you know, its own thing or whether, you know, it's, it's this, that, or the other... The ship is designed to be options for players. So, for example, you know, you might assume that every you know, siege weapon, like for example, through the DMG, pretty much uses dexterity as the modifier for those weapons. Which means that anyone who is, you know, an intelligence-based character, wisdom-based character, strength-based character, constitution, you know, charisma, whatever you want, whichever other ability you want to have is their main ability, kind of limits them in using any sort of siege equipment. So we've designed all of our weapons to be, uh, you know, individually tailored to a specific modifier. So, for example, we've got charisma-based weapons that mean that, you know, if you are a bard, it's specifically made so that you have a kick-ass weapon that works specifically for your class. You know, as well as also, we've got things that are constitution-based, where you're sacrificing parts of yourself uh, to the weapon so that it can fire. You're giving it HP as you're working with it, you know. We've tried to make this as an inclusive and an open thing as possible so that every person, no matter what class, what race, what style you play, you have something awesome to do on this airship and something that can contribute to the overall team mechanic of owning an airship, which is what it comes down to being. Is it, is it becomes a bit more of a party because you've got someone running at the helm before they dip off to go jump on a gun and someone else jumps on the helm. You've got another person down in the engine boosting the engine. You know, you've got people shooting guns. You've got people trying to, you know, activate the hull abilities, you know, and, and other people just using commands to, to issue to the air crew to keep them active and doing different things for you. So 
we really just wanted to create options for players. This is all about the players having a sick time and just being able to do even more awesome stuff than they could already do in and out of combat, basically. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about, as well, the flexibility with NPCs and, you know, what, what totally. how, how, like, it's, it, again, it's up to the, the GM and the players on how much they want the NPCs to be involved. The, or the how air well. crew. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, we have an, a brand new air crew system that basically has uh, air crew be part of the ship as well. However, they're in the background seen as to be working and to be maintaining the ship and, you know, tying things off and, you know, scrubbing bits and bobs, retrieving ammo and things like that and moving about in the background. Now, we've created a set of basic and a set of special commands that players can issue to the air crew to then activate them to do specific jobs and specific things on the ship. You know, for example, the uh, the divine protector has the ability to get the air crew to come and perform a group prayer that adds protection to the ship. You know, you also have the ability to simply say, "Hey, can you get me that item?" and you know, issue the command of retrieve me that item, basically. So, again, just a massive expanse that allows you just all these more options on your turn in combat to utilize, basically, and to 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 wield. At, at, at your discretion, basically. And all of this is done within the same combat order that already exists within 5e. The only thing that alters is we add one more step to the combat order um, that is the Zephyr movement phase. Otherwise, combat is essentially exactly the yeah. same as it usually is. You're just a player on a ship, using the ship if you so please. You also don't have to. You can stand on the deck and shoot your fireballs if you want to. You can, you know, pull out your your steampunk gun if you've got a steampunk gun in your world mm -hmm. and shoot that at people. You can use your bow and arrow if you want to. You can try and leap across to the enemy ship and, and climb aboard and, and do things like that. So it's all about just creating options for players, man. We wanted this to be a sick space to to just expand what players are able to do and experience while using vehicles because at the end of the day the vehicle is a tool it's not a player it's not it's not part of this story being awesome now don't get me wrong players might become attached to a vehicle and they might love their vehicle but it's a tool for the players to use yeah. along their journey and that's what we really wanted it to feel like for people the only thing i would add to that is that we've, we've made it as, as highly flexible as possible so you know if you're a, a gm or players at the table and you really like the crunch of having, you know, 14 or 15 different NPCs doing different things and you want them as part of the, the combat order. You can do that, I guess. Uh, but you could also, you know, kind of control the NPCs as one unit as well. So you could strip it down or you might not even choose to have uh, the NPCs, NPCs as part of the combat order. So you can do it as crunchy or as non-crunchy as you'd like, depending on what your particular flavor, your particular preferences 100%. 100%. Now, given that there are the given that there are the hintings of personal size ships mm. and get and given the popularity of certain games and espe especially certain films, the, there is one elephant in the room that I ha that I have to address. Dog dog fighting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so our favorite dude, you just addressed our favorite. Like, dude, that word, that word specifically is yeah. something that we we love and uh, and are super hyped about. You know, for me, dude, uh, D and D combat as a whole, unless you're moving every single turn, can become very static and ca it, it, it can at times become you know very monotonous. Now, with our movement and combat system, we've tried to basically recreate exactly what it feels like to be in an actual dogfight trying to maneuver understand predict and and out outthink your opponents as you battle through the sky so for example we have a, a momentum system because you know if you're in the sky there's definitely momentum uh, that is involved with that you don't just come to a halt um, due to air friction and air resistance and things like that um, so we've got a momentum system uh, we have an ability for you to perform turns, and then we also have an ability for you to change altitudes, move up, up and down to different altitudes as well. So this is a three-dimensional movement system. 
The coolest part, though, the thing that I think we're most stoked about, it's a mechanic that we really, really loved when we playtested it, was a mechanic that we added, which is essentially um, all airships move at the same time in the Zephyr movement phase. So as a player, I might go and program in some movement actions into the helm as part of my turn. And then in the Zephyr movement phase, both Zephyr, say there's two in the combat, move at the same time. And this is essentially so that it becomes a case of you're trying to react and predict what the other person is doing. Now, you can play this the normal way that we do for D&D combat, where you go, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to tell you, GM, that the movements we're going to make is I'm going to spend three speed points on forward momentum, then I'm going to spend eight speed points on making a 90-degree 90, 90 turn, and then I'm going to spend another speed point on uh, on momentum again and increasing my momentum there at the, at the back end. Um, and amazing great you've told your gm your gm might go and our ship is and my ship is going to do this movement this 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 movement and then when it comes to the movement phase they perform those movements or a way that we found was absolutely awesome is actually is if as a player you go and program movement into the helm you don't tell your gm what movement you've programmed in you write it on a piece of paper then the gm does the same thing on their turn and then when it comes to the movement phase you flip your pieces of paper and find out how the Zephyrs move. Now this truly becomes a case of you trying to predict and outwit the GM and the players at the table. It really becomes a case of you trying to think and understand what maneuvers and movement and momentum they're doing and all this kind of stuff to try and outthink them. It becomes a chess match, essentially, which is really really awesome and interesting we had loads and loads of fun mm -hmm. with that because you know there's times where we choose to go left they choose to go right and we end up ramming into each other that wasn't meant to happen but because both pilots predicted wrong we ended up in a huge collision which causes an infinite like a massive amount of damage and then you're dealing with all that you know chaos that follows that so and you could have a small ship totally. and uh, you decide to go down a zone and slow down and their prediction is, you know, they're, they're chasing you. They they choose to go up a zone and speed up, and you've just basically lost them because they've just gone right past you. They're two zones away from you. You can turn around and, and kind of lose them. So there's just, there's just a lot of really cool possibilities that in the moment it, it, it provides a really entertaining bit of, um, of reaction at the table. And why things like having someone with the pilot feet on your team and someone that has the navigator feet on your team is going to come in really handy. The navigator able to try and predict what the other ship is doing by making checks on the other ship and trying to like gain information from the GM, you know, same way we do investigation and insight checks hmm. uh, to try and understand what movements they're going to make. And, uh, and then pilots are able to minimize the amount of speed they need to spend to perform maneuvers and things like that. So it becomes this whole, you know, cat and mouse game of you, you are truly in a dogfight at yeah. that point. You're, you're right there in it. The, so, only thing, the only thing I would add is as well, now, we, you know, that's all going on, but you can also, if you just change a zone, there are some zones that are, you know, faster than others, some zones that may cause you to have enter to... Enter a storm. Into a storm, so there's, there's that element as well. So you may be thinking, okay, we're going to go up into the wind shear zone. We know that if we get up there, we can ride the currents a little bit better, but also it's a little bit less. It's a little bit more volatile up there, so who knows what goes on. So there's, there's, you know, there's, and again, you can make it as complex or as simple as you want with with regard to that. Exactly, but, you can draw out as little of this or as much as you want. You know, you could have each air zone have a different wind direction, which then becomes you're not only trying to predict the the air above and below you, but you're also trying to predict what the other ship's doing. You know, it becomes a a whole realistic, you know, situation where the pilot is really trying to think on their feet, you know, of what movement they're going to do that turn. So, yeah, yeah dude, dogfighting was one of the things that yeah. I, like, came to the table with and was like, this is, we must, yeah. we must. And three-dimensional dogfighting more than anything was, was our big thing. Now, with that in, with that in mind, mm. when it comes to... When it comes to custom, when it comes to customization beyond the beyond the entry point of a ship, because you look at a lot of a lot of a lot of ships in pl in plenty of fantasy or e or science fantasy approaches, and eventually th things will get upgraded or things will get fixed after they've gotten broken or, or the like. 
Um, do you get? Do you guys have plans regarding that? One hundred percent. So when things get broken, we have rules for repairs. One hundred percent. And then using our ship builder application, our, our Hat D Builder website application that we just mentioned, or if you want to just use the book because you're you're not a digital person, which we fully understand. Mm -hmm. um, there's the list of two hundred parts. So if your players, you know, pull in their their airship or you know, whatever vehicle you reflavored it as, um, pull it in, and they're you know, going to a mechanic or a part shop or a chop shop or, you know, any place where they could upgrade their ship, 100%. You, you, you get your players to flip through the parts. They know how much money they have. There's costs, uh, in-game cost values for how much each part costs um, and and how much, you know, it, 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 it is to kind of uh, upgrade it and, and retrofit, as we call it, uh, retrofit something into your Zephyr. So yes, 100%. All airships are 100% modular. You can swap and change anything at any point. Obviously, within the bounds of the story, I assume, uh, though I, I won't speak for GMs who want to play it other ways, but, you know, uh, with the understanding that, yeah, that's 100% feasible. So, you know, if, you, if your team has got a standard engine and uh, you've had it for, you know, the first half of your campaign, but finally you've saved up enough money to try and upgrade your engine, then hell yeah, go take it to a shop, go get that bad boy upgraded and, uh, and rock out with your new storm surge engine or, you know, your new conceal engine or, or whatever it might be, you know, and, and yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, we actually recommend that's a great way for players to connect even more to their ship because it becomes something they care about. It becomes something that they're looking after, that they're making sure barnacle swarms don't attach to, that they're making sure, you know, uh, our spick and spam, that they're doing tasks during downtime to clean and repair things and maintain the ship, you know. All this kind of stuff is, is yeah, included in the book, and we want you guys to be, m like, modularizing and customizing ships as you go throughout your campaigns, mm -hmm. for sure. And well, I don't. Well, I don't nearly play as much as I used to. I, mm. ha I am no stranger to the likes of, say, Eve Online, and how you some how people could spend hours, if not days, just going over um, how to ideally customize their particular ships. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's there's a min maxer element to it as well. For all you min maxers out there, oh, though you are a pain in GM's butts, let me tell you, <laughs> with the ship builder, you will be able to min max the absolute shit out of it. You can find <laughs> if you want to find the most OP combination to piss off your dungeon master. <laughs> we support that just as much as we support you choosing a dud of a ship because it makes sense with your character and your story. Or just picking one that's off the shelf. You know, there's totally. ships, there's ships that are pre-made that you can. You know, if you don't have time, or you know your energy's in some other place, you can just um, pick your size ship. And like we say, there's 25 of them on the you know on the uh, inventory line. You can select from and jump in the. Take any of those 25s and then customize them again to your heart's desire. You could do it that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Now, a lot of time, a lot of times when air when airships or the like are are used, um, mm. especially. And I, I especially am reminded of my times with it in, say, um, Eberron. Mm -hmm. The ma the magic question is often oh, is often overlooked. I.e., how do how do these kind of things develop when um, magic and sim and similar supernatural power is mm -hmm. something that it, that is readily accessible? Mm. And I think one of the things I, I was curious about is how you guys would integrate spellcasters within. Um, ship combat dude it, it's such a great question and it's something that we are constantly trying to like mitigate making sure that you know those players aren't left out because i feel like a lot of times they are i feel like you know if it's you know if it comes down to a gm designing a, a melee combat you know casters at times you know really struggle in some of those situations and and you know, we wanted to make it as open as possible. You know, at the moment, we're, we're working on our next Kickstarter or one of our next uh, two Kickstarters, which will be a sci-fi setting for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. And we're trying to work out how to get that balance between, you know, magic and technology. It's a hard balance, dude. It really, it really is a hard balance to strike. But what we've created for the book, essentially, 
is, first of all, all the ships run off of magical energy. They, you, they run off of power sources called Ceruleonite power gems. Now, this is our default power source. If you want to add your own power source, go for it. We're totally cool with you doing that, and it will be able, you can replace ours easy peasy. However, ours is gems that are fueled by arcane energy, typically. Now, there's some that are fueled by, for example, blood, uh, lightning, um, you know, radiant, uh, you know, radiant energy. You know, there, there's some that are fueled by other things where you're expending spell slots or dealing damage to it or sacrificing HP or whatever it might be. But primarily, they are magical gems that then turn all of the stations and parts on your ship into magical things, basically. So, first off, having a spellcaster on your ship, vital. Simply just to get it off the ground, vital. You need at least one person that has spell slots to, to charge your gem to get it off the ground. So that's that's a great start. And whether that if that's not a player, I'm sure you can hire an NPC to do so for you, or you know make one of your air crew uh, do that, or get a named NPC for your for your um, for your ship. However, from there, for people who play bards, who play wizards, who play sorcerers, warlocks, you know druids, anything like that, um, we like I said have made all of our parts and stations like essentially each one has its own designated style of ability that suits that part or or station so for example you know we have um we have uh let me let me think of uh, one of our weapons off the top of my head um oh my goodness I, none of the names are coming to me at this moment <laughs> Um, but we have many different types of weapons, for example. One of them, um, I know, um, is, for example, a charisma-based weapon. So what this means is, as a barbarian using this weapon, you have to use your chari charisma modifier when using this weapon to modify the attack rolls or whatever it might be that you are doing with this weapon, the ability or action that this weapon has. So if you're a bard, using your charisma modifier is going to suit you a whole lot more than it's going to suit a barbarian. Which is why, for example, if you have a, a group of all bards, you might choose weapons that are only charisma based. If you have a nice spread of characters, you might want a weapon that suits strength for your barbarian. One that suits constitution for your fighter, for example. You might want one that suits dexterity for your rogue. You might want one that is wisdom for your druid, you know, and we've made it so that each one of these weapons um, that is selected by the team can be used specifically by, you know, one group of people. Now, don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that just the druid can use the wisdom-based weapon. Anyone can use the wisdom-based weapon. We all have wisdom scores, so everyone can use the wisdom-based weapon. It just means it's more tailored and suited to the wizard to use that, we uh, sorry, the druid to use that weapon. So that's kind of the idea that we approach this with, is we didn't want, you know, these weapons that are seen as siege weapons to just be usable by barbarians, rogues, and fighters that are leading with their core abilities being strength or dex or con. We wanted this to be across the board, uh, you know, and it be accessible for you know, spellcasters as well. So, you know, whether you're a spellcaster stood on the deck using your spells as normal, just trying to hit things, or you're using a specific weapon that suits your spellcasting ability, um, then that's amazing as well. We're happy for you to play it in whatever way suits your spellcaster best, basically. Yeah. Now, with a lot of this, we've talked about the idea of a party of characters having a, sh having a ship. Mm -hmm. Well... <sighs> That is that is one end of the pendulum, and mm -hmm. for my next question, I'd like to swing it to the other end because if if you're familiar with older D and D, then mm -hmm. you're familiar with the concept of leveling up and eventually get eventually getting holdings, becoming somebody of note beyond just a murder hobo. Um, of course, <laughs> the game, and I'm I I'm not shill, I'm not shilling for it, even though he's a buddy of mine. Um, the game Adventure Conqueror King system really dives into this. With how, mm -hmm. with how it works, um, with its with its advancement. So, mm -hmm. the big question that the big question that I have is how, um, how this particular system would be able to handle cases where it's not just ship versus ship, but um, mm. small but small fleets against each other. 
I, re I referenced wow. Battleship earlier, and that's kind of what yeah. I'm going with this. Totally, totally. Um, so fleets is fleets is a very interesting situation. Now you know we have designed this to be able to, in practice, you could put as many airships on the board as you wanted to, realistically. Now the same question went for the air crew of like, do you want to control? You know, if you've got eighty air crew on a ship, do you want to have to, in your initiative order, control all eighty of the air crew? No, probably not. Mm -hmm. So, um, have we written specific rules for fleet to fleet combat? No, we we haven't given any sort of specific anything for fleet to fleet combat. What we wanted to do though was give you the ability to have as many ships on the field as we want to using our combat system. Now, if you want to move, you know, three or four of them as one initiative and do it like that, then that's totally fine. However, you see best to maneuver all of these different airships. Now, as a GM, I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure the GMs out there would be thinking, you know, in a, you know, and this is why, you know, across the board, D&D is not designed to handle large-scale battles. That's that's just one of the things in Dungeons mm -hmm. & Dragons that it's not really designed for is large-scale battles. Um, it's more designed to handle these, you know, encounters between basically like one to fucking 20 people that you're fighting. And we have gone along the same principle for, for this project in that we want you to be able to handle, you know, like I said, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten ships on, on a battle map at once. But also, as a GM, you've got to decide where are the story moments, where's the plot points, where's the interesting stuff happening. You know, I've seen uh, Brennan Lee Mulligan, for example, run a massive battle in season two of fantasy high in the uh in hell where there's a big you know fleet huge fleet of ships fighting each other and he centers the combat on one or two of the ships you know he he deals with the players that are on one of two of the ships we imagine gms would think in a very similar way because at the end of the day the system isn't designed for large-scale combat now don't get me wrong if uh, if there's enough outcry by the community for fleet-based rules this is something, this is a reason why we're doing our month of public playtesting. Now, this is a big, big part of this, you know, Kickstarter and what we believe in here at Homie and the Dude. It's mm -hmm. about connecting with people, isn't it? And connecting with the community. Yeah, big time. Um, so, yeah, we, we've got a, a month of public playtesting. So, our Kickstarter is going to run until September 14th, I believe. And then we'll get the version one of the PDF out to all of our backers. And at that point, our backers will hopefully be able to get out and play the game with, you know, whatever parties that they're playing in, whatever private games, whatever virtual games. All of that will hopefully provide us feedback over the course of that month that they'll present back to us. And then in mid-October, we'll accumulate all that feedback, we'll collate it, we'll consider it all, and then we'll start on version two of the PDF, which hopefully will take no more than, we're hoping, a few weeks. And, and hopefully you'll get version two by sometime in November. And at that mm -hmm. point, you will have a playable yeah. um, system that has been, not only has it been created by us, but it's been informed by you, the community, on what really works, what's really important to you, back to us. And then we'll make the tweaks, the adjustments, yeah. and then uh, get get it back to you to, to play as you wish. So the answer is yes, you could run fleet-based combat with our system. Mm -hmm. The other, the, as, as part of that answer, no, there's no specific rules for fleet-based combat. However, like I said, if there's enough outcry about it, we are more than happy to take you know a, a couple of days to work out how exactly that all would work and, and how we'd go about doing that. I, I'm sure it would be a you know, this this was a monumental hill for us to climb to come up with this system and mm. for us to develop all of this. That feels like a, a minor footnote in everything that we've done, which I'd be more than happy to, you know, bang out quickly if it was something that the community really, really wanted. Yeah. 100%. Now, I'd like to play a little bit of word association. Hell yeah. So, and admittedly, I had, I had to do a bit of digging for this <laughs> because... There's no analogy I can I can use when it comes to airships at the at the same level. So I'm using um, ships that were prominent in the in the age of sail. But mm -hmm. I'm going to give the name I'm going to give the name of a type of ship, and mm -hmm. I'd like you to t 
tell me which of the size classes you think that this particular ship, if it was, if an equivalent was made into a Zephyr, um, cool. would be. Cool. Go so, for it. Hit me with Corvette. Ooh, Wanna... dude, dude, I love, dude, I love, <laughs> I, love oh, I love it so much. Could I be a one or a so small. Much. Um, I, I, I was okay. going to say, it's either a one -er, so it's either a tiny or it's a small. So we've got um, got a couple of little, um, what we call one -ers, uh, in like behind the scenes, but they're tiny Zephyrs, um, and that would be perfect. You know, it's like a sports car, especially if you put, you know, things like Nebula sails on it and things like that. They give it, you know, massive bonuses to its speed points. You know, it could be going upwards of, you know, I, I think one of our top speeds that I was able to calculate calculate based on speed points and boosts um was something like 420 feet in a single turn so you know these these can be ridiculously fast if they're traveling in straight lines so something like that or i'd say a small which has uh, up to uh you know up to i believe 12 is what i want to say on it i might be wrong about that that might be medium it might be six um yeah it's uh, somewhere in that range but it's a a much smaller ship that's controlled by a very small group of people probably just you know a party of players you know four or five a party of players kind of thing with a couple of a uh, couple of air crew kind of a uh, situation but again they're small enough that they can be fast enough as you get higher up in the sizes ships get slower because you know a, a dreadnought you know if you look at a star destroyer from star wars it's much slower than for example an x-wing so that's uh, that's kind of the principle we went off of. So yeah, tiny or small. 100%. Yeah. But like a Corvette has a bit of a struggle with uh, with tight turns. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's good. It's good on straightaways. Yeah. If yeah. you were gonna do a Corvette, yeah, you you definitely might choose something that isn't so great at maneuverability for sure. Because <laughs> it's a muscle car. It's, it's good on straights, not so good on turns <laughs> for sure. All right. Um, Clipper. Clipper. Well, in what what are you referencing? Um. For the sake for the sake of this, I'm ref I'm reference. We'll go with the, um, we'll we'll go with the clippers that were used in the 19th century. Okay. Uh, I, I I I still have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, talking about. I would I would guess I maybe like a medium sized ship that really takes advantage of its propulsion system. So whether it's the sail configuration or the fan configuration. It's a medium sized ship that has is kind of an all arounder mm -hmm. that can that can pick up some speed if it needs is, to. Is that a naval boat, a clipper? No, a clipper's more like a it's it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mildred, but they're they're kind of they they are kind of that, aren't they? Kind of like a medium sized sail heavy ship. Yeah. They are they're meant to be speedy boys because they were or they were originally merchant ships, but they've been converted mm. they were um, at some points converted into um, ships for combat. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, I would. I would go with. I would go with a nice medium on that because you can get more people to man it. You can have you know more of that combat-based stuff, more confrontation stations, more weapons. Weapons are you know we call them confrontation stations. Um, and, um, and it can move. It has it has different options move movability. It can. It, I was going to say the medium ones are not slow. Yeah. Like that's that's definitely the case. Especially if you get like free lock propellers, you know, or an engine that has a, a good boosting a, a good thrust ability on it, mm, you know, yeah. you can definitely uh, definitely get them going fast. An all-rounder. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, so mo moving into bigger ones, <laughs> the ship of the line. Ship of the line, describe it to us. Do you know what he means? No. no. Describe it to us. What 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 uh, what reference of? Uh, by the way, I'm not proficient in nautical ships or, or or anything like that. Give me give me an idea of how how big or what it looks like in, in, um, if from, your, a from your eyes. A ship of the line, which t were tended to be the tend to be the bigger ones. One of the more famous mm. instances is known as the seventy two guns. Okay. I'll give you I'll give you one guess as to why it was called that. Um, <laughs> the I, one of, the, it was, it was a key ship because of the line of battle type type of tactic that was popular in the 17th century, you know where you okay. have where you have ships trying to get, um, on their broadside and do volley fire with all of the cannons. That's oh, I love kind, it. Okay. Um, that's kind of that's kind of where this particular concept would come would come about. 
Hundred percent. I would say you know this could be a huge or a large That's shift. I'm being a large. Uh, it could be either one. Now the large ones again. You you start looking at rapid expansion in terms of how many people you can have on the ship, how many weapons you can have on the ship, um, how many recreational areas you can have on the ship. You know how many. You know all, all, all these things expand and grow. The larger the the ship is. You know, 72 guns, that's definitely a huge. Yeah. Um, however, if you're going to, you know, just have it be like a broadsiding thing, you know, we have a great ship called the Torturous Love um, that is less about shooting volleys, but actually um, boarding enemy ships and, and capturing enemies from their ships and bringing them back to your ship to use as sacrifices to power your ship. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's one that you pull up next to them and then use the weapons that uh, one of them is a, is a, a weapon that essentially allows you to catch to cast Dimension Door and teleport yourself basically onto another Zephyr, where uh, another one are like chained harpoons that are basically like wrangling the other ship and like pulling it closer. But those weapons for that ship are on the side. So that would be a perfect example of a ship that's trying to broadside things and, mm. and come up the side and, uh, and do their battle tactics by, by approaching a ship up by the side. And it's Freaking big! It's a very big ship. Yep. Um, frigate. Frigate. That's that a one? yeah. It's a big old ship. That's big. a. Is that like aircraft carrier type? It's built just below an air. It's a big ship though. It's like a huge. Okay. It is not good yet. It's so it's huge or, or the huge is the tall. Yeah. Huge is the, well. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you have what? Do you have a next one after this one, Mildred? After frigate. Um. Actually, actually, after after frigate, I was gonna go. Frigates tend to, um, in the Second World War, they were, they were, le they were escort ships that were in between corvettes and destroyers. Oh, okay, nice. Okay, mm. that's a medium. That that's a solid medium right there. Mm. If it's in between a corvette, it keeps the speed, but it has the firepower. That's mm. a solid medium for sure. Mm. Because uh, you know, if it's if it's escorting stuff, it needs to be big enough to withstand damage and to have enough hit points to to be a freaking escort ship. But at the same time, uh, it needs to be fast enough that it can either get out ahead and defend, you know, run, you know, distract, you know, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, dude, I I would say a medium for sure. Yeah, definitely medium. Yeah. Um. Would in the the last one I'm going to use for this is the destroyer, and given mm -hmm. how the, given how that's meant to be, um, an a, a warship that was intended to escort bigger ships in. Um, fleets, mm -hmm. or sometimes just smaller convoys. Um, would you put that one as a medium, or do you, or do you think a destroyer would would fall under large? I think it would fall under large. I, I think I think it'd fall under large, just because you need that extra firepower. You just need that little bit of extra firepower, which you get with a large ship because there's just more space for for confrontation weapons. It's on the name, um, isn't it? Yeah, it, you destroyer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's not a it's not a passiver. That's for sure. It's not a pacifier or. <laughs> You know, so yeah, I would, uh, I would, yeah, I would definitely go with a, a large for that one for yeah. sure. And it's it's important to note that that um originally they were called TBDs or torpedo boat destro um destroyers, mm -hmm. and that and then it just got shortened to dis to destroyers by the mm -hmm. by the by the time the First World War came around. Okay, but, perfect. Yeah. yeah. I was tempted to bring up warship, but that would obviously be be a be huge. a large. That would be a huge man. A warship that's going to be a huge. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a huge. You get thirty two weapons on that bad boy. You can have a crew. You can have an air crew of eighty people. You can then have a bunch of you know players and named NPCs separate from just your air crew of eighty people as well, mm -hmm. which is you know a, a freaking massive ship. That, you know. Think about where all those people have got to sleep. We uh, we actually have our, our flagship, as we call it, for the huge category, is called the Wandering Tavern, and the Wandering Tavern is a uh, is a mafia owned um, airship that is poses as a portable rest stop for people in the sky to enjoy luxuries, gamble, hang out, and spend some time. But is really a big smuggling ship, and uh, this thing is the size of a freaking island. You know, it has uh, it has houses on it. It has hotels it has like five bars it has you know a, it's got a bloody whole engine room uh, and like a massive engine area it's got quarters for all the staff you know it's it's a colossal freaking ship and uh, we've got some amazing art for that as well very similar to um how's moving castle in that kind of feel and that kind of you know essence of uh, that studio ghibli 
Studio Ghibli, whatever, however you want to pronounce it, essence to it, for sure. Um, which is definitely good, because I know, for, I know for a fact that if I'm theoretically running um, Sky, Ze Sky Zephyrs, I already know which anime I'm going to be um, cribbing all of my notes from. And <laughs> that, that being um, stuff like Last Exile or Captain Harlock. Nice. Uh, That's because, sick. That's super sick. If I'm going to steal, I may as well steal from the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For and, sure, dude. And, well, the big reason I bring up Last Exile in this is one of the titular characters is the captain of his, of his own highly advanced warship, the Silvana, which is mm -hmm. which has this reputation of the of the Grim Reaper of ships because nobody's ever managed mm -hmm. to sink it. Yes, oh, love to, it. To the point it's gotten the nickname the ship that cannot die. You love it. But what are you guys shooting for as far as a page count in to in total for the for the book? Dude, that's a that's a great question. At the moment, we're it's two hundred and fifty plus. The answer is we're at the moment laying out the last couple of chapters, so we will know exactly what the uh, what the page count is once we've laid out the, the the last couple of chapters. But I think we're you know we're looking at anywhere between two hundred and fifty to three hundred pages at this point. When when all said and done, when all the stat blocks are in there and uh, and everything's in there, um, we're we're looking at a, a a big book, dude. You know, considering. You know, WotC are selling books that are, you know, in some cases, 150 pages for $49, you know, for a digital copy. You know, this you're, you're getting a ridiculous amount of, of content for for um, for what we're asking for, you know, for this bad boy. So, yeah, huge page count. Uh, and that doesn't include, you know, the battle maps that come separately if you get the extras, you know, the cheat sheets and, uh, and combat trackers that come separately if you get the extras. Um, STLs, you know, that come with it, and then, you know, we we hope to. There's two beautiful stretch goals that have been unlocked already. We've got the Iron Maiden uh, item, uh, which is basically like, a, if you imagine, like a Iron Man mech suit for for tiny creatures, um, and then we've got uh, the the Tri Ship, which is a an awesome ship that will be added to the book as well. Which again, we'll just expand the pages further, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I will certainly be looking forward to that. But with Hell all yeah. that said, I do want to sincerely thank you guys for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. It, dude, it's, it has been a wild ride here, and your temple is both beautiful and humble all at the same time. Not too, not too you know, over-decorated, but just, just the right amount of gold that you know it's a temple, you know? Just the right amount. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into Sky Zephyrs or, or, or figure out how someone could hack Crimson Skies into this, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, dude, thank you for having us on. We really, really appreciate you taking the time. And I'd love to come back on and, you know... Uh, shoot some shit about GM stuff and, and talk about some, you know, stuff of just playing TTRPGs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't uh, do, doesn't even have to be centered around uh, <laughs> Sky's effort stuff. It'd be, a, it'd be a pleasure to come back on yeah, and, and do this again, good. dude. You're, you're, you're a good host, and we, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, to feature us and to, uh, to have a conversation with us. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty yeah. more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>